I want to thank the presence of each and every one of you this morning as you are here uh, in a class that just got kicked off on Wednesday night where we are studying the Sermon on the Mount. And if you were listening to that fantastic lesson that we just heard, I want to tell you that what we're about to study fits like that. It's like a hand and a glove. Um, we're going to begin looking at the Beatitudes this morning. Simple in words. Yet, they require deep thought. They have attracted generations of Christians like nothing else. Their wealth is inexhaustible. Uh, they set forth the ideal citizen of Christ's kingdom. In a sense, they are Christ's specification of what every Christian ought to be. And there is no escape from our responsibility to covet them, to long for them, to desire them. And I hopefully you'll see that as we continue in the study. But before we get started, I'm going to ask Ryan, would you start us with a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning thanking you for all of your wonderful blessings that you bestowed upon us. Father, we are truly grateful for the ones who have come to services this morning, and we may study another portion of your word. Father, as we study on the Sermon of the Mount, we ask that we may open our hearts and our minds, that we may receive your word better than what we have in the past, that we may apply it to our lives, Father, and be better students of life, that we may bring lost souls unto you, that we may be that hand of the plow that we've been referring to for the last couple of weeks. Father, we ask that you be with Rick this morning, and he has a ready remembrance of the things which he has prepared. Father, us as students, we ask again that we open our hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All eight or nine, depending on how you want to count them, I think there are eight there, and I see the last two somewhat linked together, so I will <coughs> refer to them as eight blessings. They are qualities uh, that are commended. Um, each person who exhibits them is basically pronounced as blessed. And as Sean showed us on Wednesday night, that word blessed, a lot of people think that it, it means to be extremely joyously happy. But he and I agree that it really is more applicable to like finding favor with God. Now let me give you some examples of that. The study that we just had in the New Testament, beginning uh, our seven-year journey through through things, who did we see that was blessed in those early studies? Amen. Two women, Elizabeth, Elizabeth and Mary. 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 All right. So yes, they were happy that they received the word, but what are received the children that was uh, granted to them, but. Besides being happy, they earned the trust of God. God basically gave them favor because of what they had been doing with their lives to that point. So let's think of it as finding favor with God. In other words, if a person reacts uh, to, to his environment in the spirit of the Beatitudes, I think the life of that individual will be a happy one. Um, one that truly finds favor with God. Because I personally think they will have discovered the basic formula for good mental health. And that's important. The word blessed, or blessed, however you want to say it. Peggy and I talked about that. I said, you know, when we use that word, I always say blessed. But many times we say blessed. And we sing a song, blessed are they who... <laughs> You know, so either way we can go with blessed or blessed. But the word blessed was a powerful word to those that heard it in Jesus' time. To them, it meant, like I said, divine joy and perfect happiness. It implied an inner satisfaction and sufficiency 
that did not depend on outward circumstances for happiness. It's an inner thing. And that is what the Lord offers to all who will place their trust in Him. So what is the blessings? <clears throat> What's the reason to be happy? What is to be the outcome of God's favor? Well, if you look at each one of those blessings, the second half of each beatitude reveals what that blessing is. So eight blessings are given to every Christian. And the particular blessing promised in each case is appropriate to the particular quality that is mentioned. And hopefully we'll see that as we endeavor and go along here. The eight qualities that we are to exhibit together constitute the responsibilities and that makes the eight blessings what then? A privilege. It's a privilege of being a citizen of God's kingdom. And all eight of these blessings are promised to Jesus' followers. What was the last words that Sean shared with us on Wednesday night for those of you that were here Wednesday night? You can do this. You can do this. You can do this. So these are promised to Jesus' followers. It was true when Jesus spoke it back on the Sermon on the Mount, as it is even today. It describes the kind of people that reborn Christian should be. So the Beatitudes set forth the blessings which God bestows. And it's not a reward for a merit. It's a gift as a result of God's grace upon those in whom He is working such a character. Um, the key verse, one of the questions was asked in the last lesson, what do you see as the key verse? I didn't know what Sean was going to answer that question with, but he answered it with the same verse that I chose, and that's in chapter 5 there in verse 20. And it reads, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. Those are some powerful words. Now the Pharisees of the time taught that righteousness was an external thing. It was a matter of obeying some simple rules, although there were many, um, and all of the regulations that they created, man-made regulations. Um, righteousness could be measured by praying, it could be measured by fasting, it could be measured by a lot of things. And in the Beatitudes, the picture of the believer, Jesus describes the character that needs to flow from within. I've realized in my study of this about two years ago of the Sermon on the Mount, which I found to be a phenomenal study, I broke a code, and I got it up there. Because I do think, if we really look at the Beatitudes as to the type of characteristics that we should be having as, as Christians, you add that character. If you get your character right, character drives your conduct. And you combine character with conduct, and guess what you get? Proper citizen, citizenship within the kingdom of God. So I'm going to leave that up there, and hopefully we'll see that, and, and you will see it too if you don't see it right now. Well, let's look at the first beatitude. And it reads, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's found in chapter 5 of the book of Matthew, verse 3. What is the word poor? And sometimes when people read that beatitude, they want to just, blessed are the poor. <laughs> but what does the word poor conjure up in your mind? Uh, I think as like bankrupt, have absolutely nothing. Yeah, bankrupt. Broken. Broken. Having material needs. Um, you just, it, it, it's emptiness. But gradually, because uh, the needy 
um, need this, that word poor that Jesus used here, do you think it had significance to that audience that was before him that day? Because I would venture to say most of them understood that word because by our standard, we would consider them to be extremely poor people. Poor physically. Poor not having resources. But Jesus doesn't go there with that idea, does he? The word there, poverty, or poor, comes with some spiritual overtones. Uh, and it is to be defined as a humble dependence upon God. Somebody look up Psalm chapter 34 and verse 6 and read that for me. And if someone else would look up Isaiah chapter 66 verses 1 and 2. And if someone's got Psalm 34, 6, if they read it. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all of his troubles. Hold that thought. <clears throat> now let's look at um, Isaiah chapter 66, verses 1 and 2. I got it. This is what the Lord says, The heavens are my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where then is the house you will build for me? Where is the place where I will rest? My hand made them. That is how they came to be, says the Lord. I show special favor to the humble and contrite who respect what I have to say. Oh, that's interesting. What translation is that? This one? Yeah. It's a uh, NET. It's, okay. it's a new one I'm because trying. My, mine's the English Standard Version, yep. and verse 2 reads, All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord, but this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Any other translations use the word spirit there? Because I didn't see that in, your, in the NIP. Anybody else's eliminates that word spirit? <clears throat> it's, it's there. Okay. But the idea of a contrite in spirit. Question one in our study asks the question, what is your initial reaction to the poverty of spirit that Jesus speaks of in this sermon? To be poor in spirit? Humble. Humble, okay. Other thoughts? Well, as a child, I thought it meant that you were sad. But then, of course, as I grew up, I realized that it had nothing to do with that. Yeah. Realize that the audience that Jesus is speaking here, has the Holy Spirit really been given to the people? Mm -hmm. As we studied earlier in our study last quarter, there were people that were visited by the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth, Mary, John the Baptist, and Jesus, the Spirit came upon them, but it's not yet on the people. Don? The word in the Greek means to cower before, as the poor would cower before someone asking for alms. In other words, it's a deep, humble, or humility that he's looking at. Yes. Good idea. And just, just to kind of throw a wrinkle in it, when Luke writes about this, he says, blessed are the poor, but his next beatitude is blessed are those who hunger. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus is tying, you know, either way, he's tying that spiritual thread. How can you receive the kingdom of heaven? That's what they're looking for. They're looking for the Messiah. Okay, so you're poor, and you need to be poor to have the kingdom. You need to hunger and thirst to have the kingdom of heaven. You have to want it to have it. I think Don, Don, words there, you cower before you, you are desiring something. You desire. If you haven't noticed before as we go through these beatitudes, I want you to see how they build. Hell yeah. And they're like this. They're interconnected. That's the beauty of it. 
To be poor in spirit to me is to acknowledge our spiritual poverty. You have to think of it in a spiritual sense. Our spiritual bankruptcy before God. These people that he's talking to have not had much nurturing in spiritual things. Just like anybody else that comes new to being a Christian. The spiritual things are yet to be discovered and, and, and found. So, they sense a spiritual need and they find it supplied in the Lord. What are we all? It starts with an S. Sinners. Sinners. We are all sinners. That's important to realize that. I am a sinner under the holy wrath of God. And I deserve nothing. I deserve nothing but the judgment of God. Do we have anything to offer for our sin? We really don't, do we? Do we have anything to plead? Nothing with which to buy the favor of heaven, that's for sure. So we can see Jesus making this emphasis here, making these people try to understand the spiritual aspect of where they are, because He's not yet died on the cross. He is not yet going to pay the price for sins. But they need to have that sense of having a, a poverty in spirit in order to move forward. Just like we do. Amy? I, I, I think of it as, well, it's very biblical, a debt that we cannot pay. There's there's no way we can pay the debt. So. There is. There's no way we can pay the debt. Yeah. Don? Going back to Isaiah 66, 1, the contrite heart that we brought up in that verse is the same as being crippled, totally incapacitated by, by being crippled. And when you look at that, we have, we, we have no ability. And when you understand you have no ability and must lean fully and completely upon God, then you have reached that point of being completely poor in spirit. Well said. I mean, that, that, that's it in a nutshell. That, that really is, is the essence of it. But the second question in our, in our workbook was, what hinders us from being poor in spirit? Well, to tie it back to like the Pharisees and how um, if anyone looked at them religiously speaking, they would think they were the best people ever. They did. And they would be like, okay, they're automatically going to heaven. So kind of the, and also there's a diff difference in class systems. So like the Pharisees were seen as upper class people, and they had basically all their needs provided for them, and they thought that they were superior to the rest of, you know, the Jews. And so I think it's that like idea of superiority and I mean thinking of yourself as inferior, I guess. Okay. Good thought. The amplified says arrogance, a lack of arrogance yeah. for the humble spirit. Because that in a nutshell is what the Pharisees were. Was arrogant. They were arrogant. True. Um, it's like it's impossible to fill something that's already full and if you're training people or training animals or anything you have to break them away from themselves first mm -hmm. like they've got to get rid of themselves and then you can fill them with the training it's always the first step you hit the nail on the head yeah get rid because of there there's what hinders us from being poor in spirit so it's me mm -hmm. It's me. And until we come to that sense of being poor in spirit, that's what God wants. That's where the blessing comes. Yeah, this seems kind of odd that you would be happy with the fact that you are a sinner and there's nothing you can do <clears throat> to come out of that state. But that's where one needs to be at the very beginning, right? Yeah, and after you realize that, you can be happy in the fact that you know 
that someone has died for you and has given you access to all that. That's where that's where the blessing comes in too. It's Once true. you realize that yeah. through self realization. When one is reduced to nothing in himself and relies upon the mercy of God, finds and discovers and then relies on the mercy of God, then they're poor in the spirit. <clears throat> now imagine Jesus trying to convey that thought to the audience that he's got there before. That audience is also the same audience that's right here, including me uh, today. To such, and only to such, is the kingdom of God given. Remember, John the Baptist was out there as we studied, laying somewhat of the foundation about the kingdom of God is coming. Christ has now come upon the scene. He has a very large gathering as we studied in our last period. And I really think it's kind of cool that our study here is dovetailing with what we looked at in that last quarter of our study of the New Testament, the early times of Christ in his teaching. He's got a huge following. The state of having salvation is a gift that is absolutely free and uh, totally undeserved. Now, at this time, does the audience know that? No. But you would hope that in a few years' time <laughs> they would recall this teaching and come to that realization. Because that thought and that teaching shattered a misunderstanding of the kingdom of God that was prevalent in that time. <clears throat> what were the people looking for? A wealthy kingdom like David's. Yeah, they wanted an earthly kingdom. Just like the times of David, they wanted to get back to that. But that's not what is being taught. And so here, very early on, it's, I would think, it's shattering an understanding of the kingdom of God. In our Lord's day, as it was pointed out, do you think the Pharisees would enter the kingdom? No. Because of their arrogant misunderstanding of how good they really were. There's a lesson there for us. <laughs> Because they thought they were rich. And so rich in merit that they thanked God for their attainment. Nor was it the zealots. Because the zealots, what did they want to achieve? What did they want to bring in the form of a kingdom? The physical kingdom. A physical kingdom. And they were willing to bring that physical kingdom in by waging war and killing people if that was necessary. So, blood and sword was the tools that they thought. Somebody look up Revelation chapter 3 and verse 17. You want me to read it? Sure. Because you say, I am rich, having become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That's the New King James Version. Where, who were those words being directed to? Church Laodicea. Laodicea. Church in Laodicea. Christians. People have come to a belief in Christ. And, he, and, and, and it's revealed here that these people thought they were rich. But he says to them, you're not realizing that you're a wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. What did they miss? Christ. The point. They missed the point of the first <laughs> beatitude, did they not? They missed the point of the first beatitude. Somebody look up Romans chapter 8, and boy, I'll, let me tell you, this is rich. Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> By the way, I'll declare now that I don't think I'll get through the three Beatitudes we're supposed to get at today. But we've got, between Sean and I, 
six extra lessons that gives us some flexibility to move as we go because I do think as we can get deeper into this it's going to get I'm hoping for more interaction between Sean and you and me and, and you so Romans chapter 8 verses 1 through 11 let me read that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. That's some heavy stuff. That's some heavy stuff. But you know what that says? The avenue for being spiritually rich. It's there. Don? One interesting thing about Matthew, if you go through and look at every time the kingdom is mentioned, Matthew calls it the kingdom of heaven, except for chapter 6, verse 33, where he's talking about the entire domain of God. And throughout the book of Matthew, it is pointing toward a spiritual kingdom, a heavenly kingdom, he never uses anything about it that would restrict it to the earth. And in fact, it, the, the concept of a earthly kingdom cannot be found in Matthew. But the idea of that spiritual heavenly kingdom is there throughout the, the, the thing. And it's, it's not readily observable until you look at the entire book all by its little lonesome, if you can call it by its lonesome, see it's already got it, all of it there. When you take those 28 chapters though and look at it, the entire thing from start to finish is pointing toward what does it take to enter into heaven? Great point. And you know, we're never told, I mean, we read that the people, when they heard Jesus teach, they were amazed, they were astonished, but did he get the point? Hmm. Did they get to an understanding? Not all of them. Not all of them. Very few. Not even the righteous people. Some of the ones who studied that knew Christ was coming didn't get it. No. Yeah. Like the Pharisees. Even his own disciples? Yeah. Is it any different today? Nope. No. No different today either. As Michelle pointed out with her husband, it, sometimes it just, it's hard. Very hard. Some people just don't get it. Um, and again, the problem is <laughs> the individual, instead of just opening up their mind and their hearts. Still today, the only condition of receiving the kingdom of God is to acknowledge our spiritual poverty. That's the mindset we need to have. Any other discussion about the first beatitude? We understand the significance of that. That foundation's been laid. 
I was I was thinking about this as I was studying it about the form of spirit. I mean, that's kind of been the whole premise of God and using people even in the Old Testament. I mean, going back to, to Moses and, and Abraham, they were poor in spirit. They had to depend on him. And I just thought that was interesting it's just as a, another layer that this, this is nothing new because we've seen it throughout the whole Old Testament. Job. I mean, there's several people you can call out or you can recall that you could just throw right in there that already had that. So point. Just, that's an excellent point. Yeah, just reaffirms it. Yeah, going off of that, uh, sometimes when one is not poor in spirit, God finds a way to humiliate you. Right? Um, and I think of the example of King Nebuchadnezzar, mm -hmm. how God had to humiliate him you know, by turning him into a beast. And it wasn't until he realized that God was the one who gave him everything, that God was the one in control when he became poor in spirit and God turned him back. So it's not impossible. Sometimes it requires us to, for God to take us to the lowest steps, right? Hit rock bottom until we realize, you know, we're poor in spirit. Well, it goes back to the comment that was made earlier, your cup can't be full. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that was beautiful. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know, poor in spirit, though, is, is the opposite of the world's attitude of Self-praise, you know, self-assertion, being proud, being arrogant. Um, it, it's, it's, it, the mindset is that I'm not worth anything. You know, that's not necessarily right either. We, there, are, there is worth in us. There is worth to the point that God was willing to give up His only begotten Son. Purchase us, so it is mindful that we understand that we need to have that mindset constantly that we are poor in spirit. Yes, we grow. We don't need to remain there, but we need to have nonetheless that mindset. Any other thoughts? Don? Just just one of those things that flickers through my mind occasionally. Back in the when I was a, a kid. Get some of these old boys up there praying from the pulpit and said, Lord, make us truly humble so we can appreciate you. And as I got to be a teenager, I had one of those aha men. Do you really want God to humble you? You look at what he did to humble guys in the Old Testament. Do you really want him to humble you? <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd rather have I'd rather study this. And let it humble me, <laughs> rather than God figuring out a way to make me humble. Now we'll come to the next one: those who mourn. Um, somebody read the next verse, verse four of Matthew. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn. You know, if you looked at that translation of blessed that we've given, that some people think it is, let me say that then the possible translation of this would be happy are the unhappy. <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah. That, yeah. That translation, in my mind, presents a paradox. <laughs> a statement that seems contradictory. It's... It, in some sense, it's absurd, too. <laughs> but finding favor with God for those that mourn, I think that, that's a pretty good... Now, the question was given, <clears throat> what obstacles are on? Get the right question here. What hinders us when mourning? Put your number three first. You got it. Well, we're not going to get all of them. <laughs> but it, you've got to realize that it's not mourning over a physical loss. It's, it's not mourning, a, no. mourning over, over our sin and over yeah. the guilt that we have mm -hmm. for our sin. We should be humbled <clears throat> and shameful for what our lives have been. Everybody hear that? Because that's really the key. Well, I um, think that too correlate because, I mean, if you look at first world countries and then you look at third world countries, who are the people that are more likely to accept Jesus, like, and to have a spiritual life? 
Like, Americans are not, um, you know, Western culture is not, because we have too much, like, physically. Yeah, we do. We do. That's true. Um, I, I was, to Peggy's point, uh, it's self-reliance. You have to rely on God. You can't rely on self. To me, on this verse, I mean, if, if we're gonna have, be to the point where we understand we're, we're we're sinful and we we can't and we understand our own sin and we can't do it by ourselves because that's what we try to do. We try to do it by ourselves. But once we realize that we cannot do that, then it's rely, relying on God. Dependent, being dependent on Him, and I think it ties to the first one too. It, it's it's just layers. You're just peeling the layers back. Uh, all this points to self being out of the way. Remember, I told you about the building yeah, block yeah. approach yeah, here. I, I, I hit that for you. <laughs> <laughs> and then making sure that we are pointed toward God, because that's the only way that we're going to be able to get through this. Yeah, I'm not innocent. I'm guilty of sin. And that should make me what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should. I, I'm not self-righteous. Um, I, I Repentance is something that we still should be practicing. And what really, what drives repentance? You think about it. What's the driving force behind repentance? Guilt. Mm -hmm. Guilt. Remorse. Remorse. Yeah. Feeling sorry and sad and done. I think a good commentary on this specific morning is looking at Babylonian captivity. And at what point in Daniel and in, in uh, Ezekiel, at what point did those in captivity become happy? If we can use that term. When did they start to rejoice? When did they receive joy? It began with the promise that they were going home. But it wasn't a, until the point that they realized that they were in that mess because of the sins of the nation. And once they understood that it was the sin that brought them to that point, and they had to give up those sins to go back, that the real joy and the real happiness entered in. And it was the morning the sorrow, the tears shed because of the sins that brought them there that finally gave them the blessing of going home. Well said. I mean, again, seeing the Old Testament relevance to the lesson that David was presenting here, excellent stuff. I was just going to mention, uh, Paul talks about in St. Corinthians uh, about godly grief. And he says, godly grief is that, that mourning, that sadness that leads to repentance. Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think this is exactly what he's talking about. Recognizing what we've done is, is a godly grief that leads us toward God, that leads us toward the I'll, I'll just leave you with this thought. We'll pick it up again on Wednesday night. We mourn over sin. In fact, we should despise sin. Um, we need to see sin as God sees it. And we need to seek uh, to treat it the way that God provided for it to be treated. So, um, just lock that thought. We'll pick up here Wednesday night. Sean may get more <laughs> Beatitudes to pick up when he comes back. <laughs> Thanks. Oh,